In Libya, over 5,000 refugees are languishing in detention centers in inhumane conditions. Hundreds of people are crammed in together. They're hungry, have no clean drinking water, and many are ill. Reports of human trafficking, torture, and random shootings are common. They said, you're a slave, you black man. Then they even woke us up in the middle of the night to torture us. German diplomats talk about serious human rights abuses. So what exactly is going on there and why? Our journalists report from neighboring Niger, which has taken in 3,000 refugees from camps in Libya. These images show the conditions in Libyan jails. They were taken by refugees in different detention centers. Human rights activists describe them as trustworthy. Through messaging services, we established direct contact with two refugees who've been trapped in a Libyan detention center for two years. Their voice messages reveal their plight. We've altered their voices to protect their identities. We've been tortured, we're terrified, we're suffering, dying from different kinds of diseases. We were kidnapped. We were victims of violence. We're starving. People have died. Our life is disgusting. So we're appealing for our voices to be heard in the world. We are innocent refugees living in the land of hell. To learn more and meet the people who went through this hell, we decide to travel to Niger. This country has taken in almost 3,000 refugees from neighboring Libya. One of them is an 18-year-old woman we'll call Amina. She comes from Somalia. While trying to flee from the civil war there, she was abducted and brought to a torture chamber in the Libyan desert. Amina's abductors demanded 8,000 US dollars for her release. To up the pressure, Amina was tortured while her parents were forced to listen on the phone. They chained me up, hung me up, and tortured me with electric shocks. They tortured men with electric shocks to their genitals and women with shocks to their breasts until they cried and screamed loudly. They did it so they would get the money faster. The torture is systematic. The methods she describes match accounts from many other refugees. After a year and a half, Amina managed to escape. As she tried to cross the Mediterranean, she was picked up by the Libyan Coast Guard and forced into a government-run detention center. Life in the detention centers is 100% worse. There was not enough food. Once every two days we were given a small portion of pasta, dry bread and a little water. It's no way to live for someone who has to stay there longer. People were dying of diseases and injuries they suffered. I believe that there are barely any healthy migrants in detention. Now Amina is living in a camp run by the UN Refugee Agency. She hopes some country will take her in. She doesn't care which one, as long as it's safe. Alessandra Morelli is the UNHCR's representative here in Niger. She works closely with her colleagues in Libya and knows the conditions there. What happens in these centers is, is the contrary of life, is the contrary of respect is the contrary of uh, human rights, and it's the contrary of the right for every person to feel protected. She believes the international community needs to do more, as almost 5,000 refugees are still being held in Libyan detention centers. But everybody should feel responsible to make this stop and to find alternative, human alternative. We fly on to Agadez to learn how the evacuees from Libya are doing. The city in central Niger is known as the gateway to the Sahara. Some 1,600 refugees, all rescued from Libya, live in this UN-run camp. It's a tent city in the desert. Here we meet Ibrahim from Sudan. 
that's what he wants to be called for security reasons. He tells us he was thrown in jail and then sold into slavery. People came and bought us like slaves. And they said, we will let you work and you get money for it. But in the end, we didn't get any money. They said, you're a slave, you black man. And they even woke us up in the middle of the night to torture us. We show him videos, secretly recorded by refugees. They remind him of his own experiences. When I see these pictures, I remember my friend who was killed in the jail. He was my best friend. In Libya, lawlessness doesn't only exist in government prisons. The ongoing civil war has left the country controlled by different militias and largely in a legal vacuum. Migrants in particular are often viewed as fair game. Mariam from Sudan was abducted in broad daylight. I went out to go to a shop. Three men grabbed me and forced me into a car. They raped me right there on the street, then just threw me out onto the road. To this day, her wounds haven't healed. She says the doctor just gives her sedatives, nothing that really helps. I'm tired. I'm very tired. For four months, I've been losing blood. I never get better treatment. I'm so tired. For months I've been going to the medical center. But I just don't get better treatment. Here in Niger, she finally feels safe. But she's plagued with fears about her future. Her neighbor Ezra shares her concerns. So, tell me, how are you doing these days? Not well. I feel like I have no future. I've suffered so much. I want my children to go to school and learn something so that they don't end up illiterate like me. Many migrants still come through Agadez on their way to Libya. No one knows exactly how many. At its peak, some 330,000 people a year crossed through Agadez. The town has long been a stopping place for people from West Africa en route to find work in Libya or Algeria. The city profited from their presence. But that came to an end in 2015, when northward migration was officially halted. The European Union agreed to pay over a billion euros in aid in exchange for Niger closing the border with its neighbors to the north. Development aid as payback for stopping migrants trying to make their way to Europe. A deal nobody would admit to officially. With this deal, Agatha's main source of income disappeared. Stores like this no longer have many customers. He has been affected by the border closure too. He calls himself Abdelaziz, a people smuggler. Since 2015, his job has become a criminal offense, so he won't risk showing his face. He says the journey has also become more dangerous for migrants. Drivers must take more remote routes. And if a military patrol approaches, they'll just drop off the migrants in the desert and flee. Many die of thirst. More people are dying in the Sahara than before. You don't know where they are. The Sahara is huge, so you find them three or six months after they die. Abdelaziz also knows about the torture chambers. Often migrants first stop in Libya. He has his own reasoning why that is. The migrants largely brought this upon themselves. He explains that if refugees can't pay for their trip through the desert, their drivers sell them to torturers, mainly members of criminal gangs or militias. He says, after all, his drivers have to make ends meet. They say, I spent money on your behalf. I want to get it back and turn a profit. That's why they started torturing people. For him, there's no room for compassion. Business is business. 
Do I help migrants? <laughs> I do this to earn a living. I wouldn't do anything that's against the law to help them. Many refugees are aware of the dangers, but they won't let that deter them. To find out why, we make our way to one of the so-called ghettos on the outskirts of Agadez. Here, people smugglers hide migrants away until there are enough of them to turn a profit. Each passenger must pay around 500 US dollars for the trip through the Sahara. Usman Baldi is one of them. He's already set off three times, but each time he was picked up by the military at the Libyan border. The route through the desert is not good. Libya and the Mediterranean aren't good either. But what else should I do? When you have no other option, you must have a clear goal. And the goal for everyone here is Europe. There's no question about that. As a Guinean, Usman has little chance of being granted the right to stay in Europe. But that won't stop him. Europe wants to close the border? We, the young Africans of the 21st century, are fed up with Europe. Even though I want to go to Europe, I hate Europe. Why? Because these days Europe couldn't survive without Africa. Africa is rich in diamonds and uranium. Niger is the biggest uranium producer. And yet we pity its children. My country, Guinea, is one of the biggest producers of bauxite. After Australia, it's Guinea. I study geology, and I know that. But who profits from it? It makes me angry. It makes me sick at heart when I see the xenophobia, the masquerade. What is Europe doing to us? The anger and despair are palpable here. But so is the hope for a better life. <laughs>